Hello, and welcome to the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios at the National Press Foundation. Today we're talking about innovative use of technology in journalism. The National Press Foundation is a nonprofit dedicated to helping journalists cover complex topics with depth and accuracy. We serve journalists in the U.S. and around the world. I'm Sandy Johnson, president of the National Press Foundation. Technology can help journalists add new dimension to their reporting and storytelling. With me in the studio today is Tony Bartlemy, a reporter with the Post and Courier of Charleston, South Carolina. Tony won the National Press Foundation's 2017 Technology and Journalism Award. He's here today to tell us how he won the award. So congratulations and thank you for joining us today. Uh, so give us a little bit of background on the whole carbon project, um, Every Other Breath, Hidden Stories of Climate Change. So our, our project began, like so many projects do, with a conversation. Uh, in this case, it was a conversation with a scientist named Dennis Allen, who works at a, at a wildlife preserve north of Charleston, South Carolina, where I work. And uh, we were, he has been measuring plankton uh, for three decades. And we were talking and he said in a real sort of quiet voice, uh, so I've been measuring this for 40 years, 30, almost 40 years, and I've seen a 40% drop in the amount of zooplankton. And I thought, well, plankton, tell me a little bit about plankton. He said, well, plankton is basically stuff that floats in the ocean. You've got two kinds. You've got the zooplankton, which are the insects of the sea, and then you've got the phytoplankton, which are the kind of the grasslands of the sea. And I said, well, that's like the first link of the food chain, right? He said, yeah, and a 40% drop. I thought, wow, that's a, that's a story. Mm -hmm. And why is that a story in Charleston? Well, so I, I, I thought it was a more of a story about, for everybody, mm -hmm. for the entire, kind of the entire country, entire world, because um, I did a little bit of research and I found out that phytoplankton uh, produces half of the oxygen on Earth, or every other breath. Interesting way to put it. So Great. That, uh -huh. that, that became the title uh -huh. of our, our project, Every Other mm -hmm. Breath. And I remember going up to my boss, um, Mitch Pugh. I said, Mitch, I've got this great story. Um, it's about uh, the most one of the most important environmental issues that nobody's ever heard about. Um, and um, it's about uh, plankton. <laughs> and he kind of eyes rolled. And I said, oh, and by the way, I need to go to Bermuda and Hawaii um, <laughs> to do it right. And he said, well, Bermuda, Hawaii. And I said, well, Phytoplankton produces half of the oxygen on Earth. We've been measuring zooplankton here in Charleston, South Carolina, but mm -hmm. the only places that are measuring it um, in the ocean are in Bermuda and Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So I, I got to go to Bermuda. Um, mm -hmm. And so there I learned more about uh, the causes of, of, um, of this decline in plankton around the world and how it's incredible ripple effect from coral reefs to, um, to the food chain. And, and then we launched our series that led eventually to Chasing Carbon. Mm -hmm. And it's not really about little tiny fish in the ocean, it's about the uber subject of climate change. Absolutely, it's mm -hmm. our, our underlying theme of the series was, were, were these hidden stories, sort of hidden in plain sight, uh, stories that, that kind of had been missed because they were invisible. Uh, so let's talk about Low Country and the Edge. Um, tell me about the reporting for that. So South, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, where I wor I've worked for about 25 years, is often called the low country because it's basically at sea level. Mm -hmm. And it also has a high tidal range. So the tides come and go and sometimes they spill into our city and flood the streets even during a sunny day. And, but that kind of covered up the accelerating pace of sea rise. Mm -hmm. People would just dismiss it as, as the tides. So we did an in-depth story about, about the, the accelerating pace of sea rise. Mm -hmm. And how did you visualize that? We did a lot of time-lapse photography mm -hmm. to, to show how the tide would come and go and how there were, um, it happened on beautiful sunny days, no rain at all. Mm -hmm. That was one, one thing. And then we did some, some other kind of types of measurements that kind of looked at where the hot spots were. Mm -hmm. And what what is the projection or trajectory of those, of that low coastal tiding? So, and we used to have um, one or two days a year where the tides, the high tides, regular high tides or abnormally high tides would flood the city. 
Mm -hmm. And last year and the year before, we had about 50. So on average, once a week. Mm -hmm. They're projecting in, really in 20, 30 years, as many as 180 days. Every other day, the city will flood unless something is done. And the economic implications of that? Billions of dollars at, of property is at risk mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In, in South Carolina. And this is affecting Florida and all across uh, the coastal um, coastal areas. The entire country. seaboard. Yeah. Right, right. So not just about Charleston. It's a story for everybody. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what about fade to white? So fade to white was um, ab about coral bleaching, which a lot has been done about coral bleaching. But it turned out that we discovered that there was a coral reef off of Charleston. Nobody really knew about it. Um, and it was one of the northernmost coral reefs um, known. And with I, the very interesting history. With a very, yeah, it, was mm -hmm. a, it, it, it began as a, as a shipwreck. Uh, a ship had be, been sailing toward uh, South Carolina and it got uh, in trouble in a storm. Uh, it was carrying cement and it went down like a ship with cement. Mm -hmm. um, how long ago was that? It was more than 100 years ago. Right. Mm -hmm. Roughly 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, over time, a coral reef developed on it mm -hmm. uh, that very few people knew about, just a few divers here and there. Mm -hmm. And so we use that as a vehicle to describe the greater issue of coral bleaching, which is this underwater catastrophe um, with huge impact around the world um, that's hidden beneath the waves. Another hidden story, right? And plankton, I guess we talked about that a little bit, but why is that an urgent mystery? So plankton, yeah, it, it produces 50% uh, of the oxygen we breathe. It you know, makes the Amazon rainforest kind of look, look minor in comparison. And as the ocean becomes more acidic uh, because of added uh, carbon dioxide, and as the climate warms, that's doing wacky things with the, with the, um, with the plankton. Um, that could be, some scientists are predicting very, very severe consequences because of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that brings us to Chasing Carbon, which is the project that um, won you the Technology and Journalism Award. So congratulations again. Uh, I was taken with uh, the nut graph of this story uh, or project. Carbon dioxide, the prime driver of climate change, has no color, no odor, no hiss, no roar. Carbon dioxide is invisible but what if it wasn't? So we're gonna take a look at the video that, that you produced to go with this uh, project. Our seas are rising. Our coral reefs are bleaching. Our weather is off the charts weird. Climate change is serious stuff, but where's the sense of urgency? Maybe it's because we can't see the main cause of climate change, the rapidly growing levels of carbon dioxide. After all, CO2 is basically invisible. But what if we could? What if we could find a way to make CO2 visible? Well, a company called FLIR makes a special infrared camera that actually sees carbon dioxide. We borrowed it, and the hunt was on. Here's what a car's tailpipe looks like to the naked eye. And here's what the CO2 camera sees. And here's what the traffic on King Street looks like. And check out all the CO2 from this bus. Ships in the harbor look like giant floating torches. And CO2 shoots out of airplane engines like flares. All this can make you wonder about this stuff. Mitchell Colgan, chairman of the College of Charleston's geology department, gave us a crash course. What fossil fuels are, are plant material that formed millions of years ago. They contain that sugars and the other materials that has a large amount of the carbon. We burn that carbon in oxygen and we produce CO2 in water. And you're changing the whole heat balance of the earth. Okay, back on the hunt. Vehicles are responsible for a third of the world's CO2 emissions. But power plants pump out another third. Here on Charleston's peninsula is SCE&G's Haygood plant. To the eye, its stack looks dormant. The camera shows something else. 
farther inland, Santee Cooper's Plan and Cross is by far the biggest man-made source in South Carolina. Every year, it pumps out 25 billion pounds of CO2. We add carbon dioxide in so many ways. From yard work, to the types of cars and trucks we drive. Yes, as the camera shows, we are surrounded by fires. Enough, in fact, to trap heat equivalent to four atomic bombs going off every second. So we live in a world of combustion, and climate change isn't going away. But at least its source isn't invisible anymore. It's as real as the switch you just flipped, the pedal you just pushed, and the breath you're about to take. So, Tony, how did you come across the FLIR technology? So, I was thinking really hard about how, how to do this story in an innovative way. Because when, you, when people hear the word climate change or global warming, I don't know, I think they, they tend to just look away and feel this sense of Im impending, uncontrollable doom. And so, you know, I thought, how could I make this interesting? And um, I, uh, I, somebody pointed me toward a documentary that had briefly used this camera. And I saw that and I thought, hmm, this looks interesting. And then I also came across a reference um, to an environmental group that had used this camera, a, diff a similar type of camera, to um, capture images of a massive methane leak in Los Angeles that happened mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. So I did a little bit of reading and I thought, wow, this, this would be really interesting uh, if I could get my hands on the camera. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just called up uh, FLIR and said, hey, um, I heard about this camera. Is it, I don't have any money. I can't can't rent it um, unless it's really cheap. Um, mind if I borrow it? And I and I tried to say, look, hey, you know, you know, we can't. Um, you know, this is not a commercial. Um, this is journalism. Um, we can maybe, uh, you know, put your watermark on it just to make sure people know what what this technology is and why. And and I think I kind of pitched it as helpful to both of us. Mm -hmm. but, um, and branding said, for them. It mm -hmm. was branding for them. It mm -hmm. was you know good for um, you know it, it would show their technology in a in a different setting because this particular technology was mainly used in the gas and oil industries to to capture um, carbon dioxide leaks. Mm -hmm. And the the company itself um, is does a lot of work for defense contractors. Does a lot of thermal imaging um, technology for for the military. Mm -hmm. So they they thought about it um, and they said okay here. Um, uh, and a few weeks later, I got a big package um, containing a $90,000 camera. <laughs> and did they send someone to help you with it? Or did you and your um, video or you know, uh, photography team figure it out on your own? They, 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 um, they had a web tutorial that mm -hmm. they give to industry that was kind of complicated because I don't have that industry background. Mm -hmm. But we figured it out. We, you know, we spent about two days just pressing buttons mm -hmm. to see what would happen. And who's we? So uh, Chris Hanklosky, who was a, our videographer at the time, mm -hmm. um, he and I worked on it on it together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how did you decide where to go and what would be the best visuals to make invisible carbon dioxide visible? Well, that was perhaps the most. That was fun. That was mm -hmm. just pure fun because we had. All we had to do was really think, like, where, what are sources of carbon dioxide? So it became a treasure hunt. Mm -hmm. And you know, first thing I did was I filmed myself, I filmed, I filmed my colleagues, and especially ones who have, you know, tend to talk a lot and have a lot of hot air. Oh, so it's literally true. <laughs> it is true. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so I did that, and then mm -hmm. uh, Charleston has a lot of carriage horses. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, let's go film a horse. Um, and then we got a little more serious and started filming, uh, videoing things that we know produce a lot of carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. things like power plants, um, things like um, you know, tailpipes of cars. Why don't we go ahead and go through this list now of things that you, that you went out and saw. Tell us how you, how you scoped it out, how you then were able to um, show what the, the carbon footprint of these various things. Yeah, so um, we you know I know that s small internal combustion engines produce a lot of carbon dioxide. I, I learned that just by doing a lot of 
and kind of Googling around and, and like a car or truck or, or actually garden equipment. Oh, Gar garden, garden equipment. like leaf okay. blowers mm -hmm. and and mowers are these sort of very significant contributors to um, to various forms of pollution mm -hmm. um, that aren't really talked about much. Mm -hmm. So I I knew exactly where the gardening crews uh, work in the morning. So I went and, and took some pictures um, of them. Buses seemed like an obvious thing, um, we, so we just camped out at bus stops and mm -hmm. watched them come and go. Uh, there, there are some um, videos that I remember we saw s some some buses just leave this huge plume of, of CO2 behind them, mm -hmm. and the buses were empty too, so it, <laughs> it, it created some interesting transit-related questions. Mm -hmm. uh, took a lot of picture, a lot of vi video of, of, of tailpipes of cars, mm -hmm. including electric cars, just to show the contrast. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, we um, and then you know, coal plants are the biggest contributors to CO two, mm -hmm. and I know that from doing a lot of research on um, on coal issues over the years. Mm -hmm. So we went to the, the biggest coal plant in South Carolina um, and camped out there, um, which they didn't like. Within minutes, I had uh, employees telling me to leave, mm -hmm. um, and also um, ships. Charleston is a very large port, port mm -hmm. and ships are also very significant contributors to um, air pollution. Mm -hmm. So, were you able to quantify any of this? I mean, I know you had the visuals, mm -hmm. but um, were you able to match what um, a leaf blower versus a car versus a ship versus a power plant, um, what their CO two emissions were? We have some a little bit of data in the, in our story that we wrote that, mm -hmm. that talked about the contributions of lawn equipment, uh, and also uh, some the, the incredible contributions that coal plants and and um, mainly coal and natural gas plants produce. Mm -hmm. um, they're just kind of off the charts in terms of volumes of CO2 produced. Mm -hmm. And this is all invisible to the naked eye. Yeah, well, there was right. one natural gas plant that we had. Um, that I know only runs on exceptionally hot or cold days. It's called mm -hmm. a peaker plant. Mm -hmm. And it's just sort of sitting there, white smokestack. Nobody really pays it any attention. And But uh, um, we camped out there and took some shots of it um, during a hot day. And you could just see this massive, massive plume of, of CO2 coming out of it. Mm -hmm. And so how long did you have the, the FLIR camera? Just a week. Uh -huh. Just a week. I wish I had it for two or three weeks because it was. I had a smile on my face every time I came back if, into the newsroom because it was just. Uh, yeah, it was fun to kind of look for things that were hidden, uh, hidden smokestacks, and mm -hmm. burger. Go to the Burger King or a fast food restaurant, see what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So you had um, presumably a ton of footage. How did you decide how to put together the project to, to match the technology to the journalism? So we really look for the most dramatic images, mm -hmm. and uh, so the the technology is is pretty good. It's um, it, it, it's some of the images were kind of grainy. It's not perfect, um, so we just picked whatever kind of was the clearest, which um, that might resonate with readers. Mm -hmm. So it, a few images sort of stood out. Uh, mm -hmm. And how long did it take to put the project together from start to finish? And how many people were working on it? Can you sort of describe the internal sausage making? Yeah, so uh, uh, for the Chasing Carbon took a, probably about a month um, to do, um, maybe longer, because you know it, it, I, I was doing other pro climate change stories at the same time. The whole, pr whole project took about a year. Mm -hmm. um, we spent a lot of, invested a lot of time um, to, to kind of dig just a little deeper than you normally dig. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I did uh, most of the research. Um, our videographer put together uh, the videos. We have a team of editors um, and graphic artists who, who uh, worked on it as well. Uh, and that's how the sausage really was mm -hmm. came together. Um, how did you roll out the project? We, uh, we, had, we rolled, it, rolled it out over time. Um, there was, we did some of the early stories uh, about plankton, I guess, kind of early on, um, that seemed to capture really the community's attention mm. for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, and I tried to do, I tried to write it in a way that wouldn't just sort of hit people over the head and would kind of seduce them into being interested in something as weird and uh, uh, as plankton. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it really kind of got people interested. The stories are very readable and approachable. 
Yeah. Well, one thing I made, I wanted to make sure was, was that they were written on a level. So there's this interesting app that I found. It's called the Hemingway app. And it determines, if you put a piece of writing in it, it determines the, read the reading level. Mm -hmm. And so I, I started ex um, experimenting with it. And I found that early on in my career, when I was younger, my stories were written on a 12th grade level. I thought, oh, this isn't that great? And then I looked at some of my more recent, more successful stories, and they were written on a fifth or sixth or seventh grade level. And I thought that was really an epiphany to me because it really shows you really have to write at a very simple, clear level, and that that's not easy to do. But those are the stories that really, really connect. Mm -hmm. you can just connect with more readers that way. Mm -hmm. It's called the Hemingway app. It's the Hemingway app. Um, yeah, and you just. Yep, just plug it in. and Sounds like something fun for everybody to pull up and run their copy through. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so how could other news organizations replicate what you did with this project? Well, I was amazed that nobody had done it. That was my, you know, I thought, wow, somebody has, ha has to have done this before. Mm -hmm. And nobody had because it's so visual. Mm -hmm. You know, no TV folks had done. I think they probably could just call up FLIR and they would be happy to lend it. Mm -hmm. um, it's the only camera of its kind in the country, they told me. Um, wow. Essentially mm -hmm. put together by a bunch of engineers as a, almost as a fun project to do. Mm -hmm. It's specially tuned to get CO2. Mm -hmm. um, they tend, they make cameras for, uh, for methane and other things that are more um, toxic. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it would be very easy to replicate um, if, if um, um, if they did something similar. Uh. Mm -hmm. What did you hear from your readership when these stories were published? So our mm -hmm. stories really resonated. Um, I was a little surprised because mm -hmm. climate change stories sometimes don't get a lot of readership. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, I, I got an overwhelming response to our, our early stories about plankton, um, <laughs> and then we decided to kind of continue this series. It really, it played into the debate about Charleston's place in, in amid rising seas. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, that is the kind of big concern. And it didn't hit people over the head with, hey, the sky is falling. And that was, I think, important. Um, we can't write stories that just, that, that say that, because people will just turn off. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it really began to reach play into the debate about what to do, um, how to protect the city. And before we did the series, the city was just kind of had a he its head in the sand. It was, it was, it's, the city leaders were talking about, oh yeah, we think this is important, but they really weren't taking any action. They had this plan for the future, for the next hundred years um, uh, for the city. It's Century Five plan, and it didn't mention sea rise once. <laughs> Unprepared. Yeah. So after all these stories, um, uh, the kind of intensive coverage, uh, now it's the number one priority in the city, according to the mayor last week. Mm -hmm. So there's been an official reaction. Official reaction, yeah. And what are they doing? Or what? I mean, is there just a task force set up, or are they actually taking um, you know positive action? Right now it's a lot of planning because mm -hmm. it'll take a lot of uh, engineering and planning to, to build seawalls, which, which is which one option. Which you already have there, right? Yeah, and they mm -hmm. need to raise them. Um, some massive drainage work kind of like, like you see in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. um, some buying of properties po probably that are in low-lying areas, mm -hmm. retreat. So there's a huge, expensive, long-term effort now. And people kind of, everybody's sort of in agreement now, where mm -hmm. before, yeah, mm -hmm. it was not a big deal. Okay, and Tony, you also have a book that's just come out recently. I do, and uh, I'm very lucky to work for a newspaper that invests in investigative journalism. And a few years ago, I did a story, a series of stories about a surgeon in, in Charleston at the time who was teaching brain surgery in Africa. Brain he, surgery in Africa. He was teaching brain surgery in Africa, um, and it was sort of a teach of man to fish story with brain surgery. Mm -hmm. um, it was a finals for a Pulitzer Prize, and we turned it into a book um, that was published by Beacon Press um, recently. Um, call, it's called A Surgeon in the Village. Mm -hmm. Great, we'll look for that. So is there anything else that journalists would like to know about how you put together this entire project and how it might apply in their newsrooms? I think it's important to remember to try to do something in a unique way. And don't, and don't hit people over the head with it. Um, go for something that's maybe a little um, out of the box. It'll pay off. 
it will indeed pay off. As Tony found out, it won him a national award. So our thanks to Tony Bartlemy, a reporter with the Post and Courier of Charleston, South Carolina. Resources from this video tutorial will be posted up for your use on MPF's website at nationalpress.org, where we make good journalists better. Thank you.